very much on the subject. I have to, uh, for protocol, to say some things of our own nation, uh, Dr. Haber Ruby, uh, without the Haber's uh, initiative and the vision, I should say, uh, this uh, encounter would not happen. And uh, also the initiative uh, for the grant uh, uh, that was awarded to the program of Amir Abedi and Professor Deleuze, uh, in a way, uh, Hava was the mediator in this encounter, and I think that she deserves uh, our recognition. In the framework, uh, at least in music, whoever deals with, uh, like me, with non-Western music where improvisation is the main name of the game, uh, I am very glad that I'm relaxed to play a little bit and improvise. So my, uh, my second invitation will be to uh, Professor Ludovica uh, Luger from the University College. Ludovica will speak in the afternoon, but we ask her to, uh, to already uh, Follow up, following up uh, the, the uh, Oron's uh, presentation, and this is with the agreement with Haba, just to set up uh, the, uh, the general framework of the conference. Then we will go into a break, but we will start with Professor Galese at 10:30, Kuntlish, really sharp, because we want to keep the timing of the conference as we program. So we will have a slightly larger coffee break. You can relax and then 10.30 we will be here. Ludovica, in the name of our guests. <laughs> Prego, signora. What the hell is supposed to say? Yeah, yeah. Are, you already, are you already in trouble? So can I get a chair? Are you already in trouble to find something to say about this one? And now I also have to improvise about something else. So, well, you were saying something. Sorry, I sit down <laughs> because it's too much to stand up after the wine we drank. <laughs> so I have to feel how much time I have to fill in. <laughs> so give me a slight idea. <laughs> you were saying when you put uh, scientists and people from humanity together, something great come out. Uh, depends uh, which <laughs> scientists and which people from humanity you put together. I have difficulties in putting myself together, having studied philosophy first, neuroscience after, and now and I really have troubles in <coughs> finding the real identity. But I think that it is fantastic what Ava has done. And uh, personally, you realize a uh, dream I had. Uh, I've been growing up uh, uh, you know, reading for almost over this year. We are here, New York, uh, London, Milano, and next year in Jerusalem. And uh, being here, very close to Passover, is really something that was a dream of uh, my growing up uh, in a Jewish family. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's great what you have done to put this discussion together because uh, the future of neuroscience is in contamination, I think, with, uh, with uh, the humanities, all of them. What we are trying to do with uh, Senior Zeki when uh, he started this business that is now called neuroesthetics was uh, to have been invited in his laboratory as a philosopher to start to you know, open and widening the scope of uh, neuroscience because the kind of question we were asking as a physiologist of vision were too narrow and, uh, and, and vision is something so complex that involves everything, it's not uh, involving only the eyes and the perception that we couldn't proceed any longer starting you know, uh, the air, the vision, motion, telescopy. There was not enough. There was not enough to explain the visual process, so we had to look outside the field to be inspired in carrying on with the physiological experimentation. And so art was uh, the way to, uh, you know, to get back the complexity which in science very often you are up. We were discussing in the taxi coming here now. It's true that we have to take an approach uh, step by step. If you study vision, you start from you know, the firing of a single cell uh, recorded by the visual cortex of <coughs> the monkey, but then you don't explain vision in this way. And you have to <coughs> add up slowly, slowly, little blocks uh, to get a broader picture, right? 
I don't know if uh, we, we live enough uh, to see this uh, broader picture ourselves, but uh, you know, it's, it's definitely we have to get out of our borders in order to see. And, and I think what is, uh, what is fantastic about uh, the contamination of disciplines is that it's not only that they give you a new way of uh, looking at things and, and find inspiration to proceed with your, with your own work, but they give you the theoretical framework in which you can interpret your very small results and scientific contribution to research. I think we, we, need, uh, we need to have a huge and, and interdisciplinary theoretical framework in order to do our daily job. And this theoretical framework has to come from The story, you will take it if you want. <laughs> you want to carry on feeling in. The story, there are, there are a lot of things which, which can, uh, can be said. You know, when, when Abba gave the title to this symposium of uh, looking, uh, looking, uh, touching with the eyes. I, I didn't know, I mean, I, I had troubles in explaining vision from the eyes before, so I didn't know exactly how to approach the, the question of acoustic visuality, but I thought of, um, of uh, an artist, she's a, a contemporary French artist, her name is Sophie Kall. Uh, she's very famous for this, um, performance uh, project called uh, Carnet Dress. She found uh, a book for me, you know, the, the, the thing we used to have uh, for the numbers, the telephone numbers. She found these things in the middle of the road in Paris. And uh, she started to contact all the people inside the phone book, uh, asking them to, um, to draw a portrait to describe the owner of the phone book. And so she created a portrait of this person who wrote the book through the, you know, the interview with the people that he met him. And uh, of course she's been sued by, by him when he came back. <laughs> <laughs> and another project she has done is called Blind. So nothing to, to do with touching with the eyes, but has to do it with touching with the eyes. Can her name on So Fikal. <laughs> Then she asked her people who became blind to describe uh, what, uh, what the last visual image they had. And in another section, she asked uh, blind people born blind to describe the concept of beauty, to describe what they, what they think is beauty. And there is a girl, I actually have uh, pictures later in the afternoon, I can show it to you. And uh, one of these girls, Described first a uh, uh, landscape uh, in, uh, somewhere in uh, England, and then saying that what, what she liked about it was the immensity of the space. And she was scared to walk on the flower because uh, she's scared of walking because uh, <coughs> she could uh, damage the flowers. And then she said that there, there was also a mass relief with flames pointing up like swords. And she said, I didn't know, I found it this thing so beautiful because I didn't know that one could touch fire. I didn't know what a flame was like. So when, uh, when Squix and Mirazeti for years we've been telling everyone during lectures that art is a way of acquiring knowledge, is a very nice conceptual thing to say. But, but what does it mean? Knowledge. And when I first read this uh, description of beauty from this world, I was a blind person who cannot touch a flame. How do you know what a flame is? And when she gets a feeling of touching the grass with it, of what a flame is, it's so simple and so straightforward. And, and that's it. And 
this is touching the eyes, but without eyes, and anyway, there is an overlap in the visual cortex of the blind people. There is a, a mapping of tactile information. So it's all, it's all there. It's all, you know, we cannot even call it the brain anymore. We have to call it the nervous system. We have to call it the nervous system because it's everywhere. When, when I teach neuroscience to kids, the first thing I say, what is your brain? And they always go like this. Oh, I don't call it like a brain. <laughs> it's in, in your toy, it's everywhere. So, I think, I don't know, we were discussing yesterday this between bottles and bottles of Picasso wine. I have to say that this Israeli wine is really good. And that, if a goal a headache the morning no headache, after, no headache. no headache at all, we are like flowers <laughs> in the green the grass fields of England's fields. <laughs> and, uh, and we were discussing about all this. Uh, this, uh, this uh, one more, I forgot what I wanted to say. <laughs> Maybe there is an after, after effect of two of But uh, uh, the brain, yeah, 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 yeah. You were telling the brain is everywhere? The brain is everywhere. And you are moving to a different sound. Yeah. Like. <laughs> <laughs> you hoped I was moving to a different topic. <laughs>
I cut myself, I bite myself, I expose my my interiority to the outside and all these things by you know, Gina Pane, Luca Conci, Marina Abramovic and, and what a way of exploring the new role and, the, and it was done through their own bodies, through their own, their, their own personality and it was also a moment in the history of all these things that were very common in the United States at that time and was also a, a way of exploring the role in the society, not only what I'm hiding as an artist here, but what is my role of especially women, they were changing their way of being recognized uh, socially. And, and so this, this was a, an exploration of new meanings uh, to art to speak into. So that means that I have to carry on talking. Begin from the beginning, please. I forgot it already. <laughs> See, it's very interesting. Uh, it's very interesting what happened in this exploration of uh, of uh, of the you know the new meaning of art. What happened in the Soviet Union, in the former Soviet Union? where art uh, took uh, a very a huge shift uh, when, uh, when uh, you know, the artists during the Soviet time were the artists of the system, or uh, so you had to paint portraits of uh, a very happy man uh, with a child in their arms, like Soviet posters. Or, and uh, and uh, either you were one of the artists of the system or you were out. And when, uh, when the Soviet Union fell, uh, among other identities that one should fight for, uh, there were the one of the artists. They they finally could express themselves, but uh, but uh, they they didn't learn it. They had to find way of. Uh, and when uh, I was telling yesterday to them that when uh, uh, there was already a lot of video art uh, going on in the rest of the world, but uh, during the Soviet time, it was impossible to find video cameras in, in Russia. So when uh, one of the artists could, uh, could get a video camera from the black market, the first thing they had done was pointing the camera towards themselves as to make a statement, you know, I'm here, I'm in front of the camera. I was not recording the outside, I was recording. And, and I think this is in the same line, you know, to put the body and the person, anyway, <coughs> the, the same thing, the body is our appearance, external appearance, in the center of the research. And it's very interesting how all these things are coming together. And, uh, and it's something I think we can uh, still, uh, as a scientist, we can learn from art again. You know, you, you explore all this, uh, artistic current or this research and you can find point of comments. I, I never know exactly where, when you put together disciplines, I don't know if you really are aiming towards something. You know, what, what are we trying to explain is, uh, is at the end of the human being and it's, we are so complex uh, that how, how do you do it? What do you do? What? How do you approach it and approach the problem? But, but it, it's anyway very interesting to expand the borders and to look on the other side and to look what is going on there. So I don't know what is, uh, you know, the the, the, the important thing about uh, uh, looking at body art in order to explain the embodiment in perception. I don't know if it's, uh, there is a validity or not, but it's worth having a look of what they have done. It's still worth uh, knowing what is there. And, uh, and you, you never know when you can get inspired about something. Oh. What do you think, Mark? Mark, <laughs> Mark do you want to say something? <laughs> I think there is a, there is a, there is a, we need, uh, find the 
new possibilities, find new meanings, and find to expand even the way in which we dream. We are here on a heart, we, we are born, we die, we know we are going to die, so it's going to be a, a bit boring to be on the heart just like that. And, and we need to get out from this in, ineluctability of our destiny. And, and we can do it very easily. You know, what we do with dreams? We, we get, um, we open a field of possibilities, you know, and this is what, what art does, but what religion does, and what, and is that uh, opening up again the ability of looking at things in a different way. When we were at a, a congress together in Prato, I always tell these things, I was so taken by the sentence he said. There was the director of the museum that were hosting the, the conference, and, uh, and the, the director at some point asked her, what do you think it would happen in the world if art has had to disappear? Suddenly, no more art in the world. And someone answered, you know, everything would be so disgusting and awful to go back. And an artist present, is an artist with a medical background, actually, uh, Cesare Pietro Iussi had a microphone in his hand, and he said, if art has to disappear from the world, this microphone would be only a microphone. It would lose the possibility of being something else. And I think this is, this is the thing. Uh, we, we, we have to be able to, through the body, to whatever, to acquire, to give new meaning, to look at things from different points. But I, I have finished. <laughs> <laughs> And also, uh, our colleague, uh, Professor Paul Frosch, Paul, uh, don't be so shy, from the Faculty of Social Sciences. We are very proud that this conference, I, I don't know, uh, you will correct me, the vice rector, it there are many antecedents of a conference organized by three faculties. And I think it's quite unique. I don't think there are many. So the last word before we go into a short uh, break to our organizer, Dr. Haban Duke. Haban, please. Yes. I just want to say, first of all, thank you. Thanks, Ludovica, for this magnificent, magnificent talk. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, uh, Vittorio, Professor Mark Hansen from Duke University, Professor Vittorio Gallese, and the uh, art historian Gersh, who is here with us. Um, I, I uh, contacted uh, Ludovica about over a year ago, right, last February. Uh, because I knew she was working with Semiozeki, and I started um, uh, taking interest in this field of neuroaesthetics, which was very new to me. And I told her, I sent her a brief proposal, and I told her, I'm an art historian, and I'm having these thoughts about haptic visuality, and I know you're working with Semiozeki, and perhaps we can do something together. And we spoke, <laughs> and Ludovica said, hey, listen, I'm hanging up. It's not the music you need. You need to have Vittorio Galese. <laughs> and, <laughs> I'm, yeah. <laughs> and she just said, you know, I'm calling him up immediately. And we had a, a triple conversation. And this is how it all started. I'm very happy that we're here today. And this is happening thanks to the Edmund Lee Saka Center for Brain Sciences. I think I'm correct. And um, I wish you all an enjoyable symposium. I think it's going to be stimulating and thought-provoking. Thank you. Experiment refers to a multi-layer state in which several dimensions can be distinguished. This is not supposed to be a complete taxonomy, but I was just listing what came up to my mind when, when I think what's going on when I'm facing Davide or Michelangelo. So there is a mere perceptual effect. But this perceptual effect, you immediately realize, uh, suppose you are facing the old walls of Jerusalem. 
in a sunny day like this, but while you're filling your tax form. <laughs> and then the next day, your perceptual system has the very same input, but the tax form has been filled, you are released from that burden, you're listening to some nice music, and the walls make a totally different phenomenal experience. So the activation of the receptors uh, of the uh, optic tract of V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, and whatever, uh, doesn't tell you anything in principle about the different phenomenal experiences uh, by merely looking at the very same object. There's something we project, and I will not deal into the projective aspect of, hopefully you will do, because you, you, you were the head of psychoanalysis, so you're more, <laughs> uh, that's more in, in your, um, in your arena. But here I will only